Welcome to Renewal Conversations as part of the Team for the Soul. We are having conversation as part of being in an oasis of regeneration in the midst of action. This is meant to help you as a giver to regenerate and renew in the shared space of science, psychology, spiritual care, and ancient Christian faith. I'm Dr. Ioana Popa, the host of the Renewal Nuggets and Renewal Conversations. And Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Tom Holmes, who is an international trainer for psychologists, social worker, counselors, and holistic therapists, and his specialty is in spirituality and therapeutical process, psychological process and methodologies. And Tom is a, the author of The Parts Work, an illustrated guide to your inner life, which has sold more than 50,000 copies. It's a wonderful book. Um, really to the bringing to the core of how to have inner conversations with different aspects and parts of ourselves. Tom is a PhD in counseling psychology, has taught at Western Michigan University, has been training graduate students, and in the same time, he has two international programs, one based in Germany and another one based in Jordan, where he is helping and training therapists in the internal systems therapy and spirituality. He brings a wealth of knowledge, of wisdom, and professionalism in his work. And I have the pleasure to introduce Tom today. Welcome, Tom. It's so good to connect with you. Yeah, I'm glad we have a chance to uh, come together and to share a little bit about uh, both the things that you're doing and some of the ways that uh, what I'm doing might be relevant to the folks that you're reaching out to. Yes, yes. And I know we know each other. We're just talking 2014, probably. But it would be helpful if you'd like to just share about a little bit about your vocation, about your journey, especially as you, all your life, you've been dedicating helping others. So this is kind of the audience or people who really like to help others. And um, I thought you'd be such an inspiration. So yeah, it, that's that opening. I was, you know, thinking about that when I thought about it. Oh, my gosh, it goes back a long, long time. You know, I. Um, uh, I was raised in a, a small town in, in rural Michigan in a, in a little Methodist church. And uh, I guess the, my church vocation was the kind of the early ways of seeing service as an important part of life. Um, um, but uh, my professional work began really when I finished uh, college, I started working in substance abuse prevention in the early 70s. and um, uh, at that point, I, I was working with youth and, and doing a lot of the listening skills communication. That was a big thing there, the whole Rogerian training, which I still find to be a foundation of what I offer people. But I realized at that point that I needed more um, training. So I, I ended up getting a master's in uh, clinical psychology, a master's in social work and a PhD in counseling psychology. So I just kept getting, I said, well, I need to know more. I need to know more. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, I had a chance when I was in my master's program in clinical psych to um, do some small training groups with a professor and to lead some um, small group uh, training groups. And I loved it and people responded well to me. And I, that's really the work that I've been doing since then. It's probably almost close to 50 years now. Um, and after, and I, I taught for the, in the university for 20 years and then retired early about 15 years ago so that I could just do my advanced training in, in psychotherapy and especially the integration of spirituality and psychotherapy. And so I wanted to do that around the world. And that's what I've been doing for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Oh, that's so exciting. And what brought you to help others? Like what is kind of the inner motivation i mean it's kind of obvious but it can be so unique for every, every person you know i i guess i i grew up in the 60s right and um you know a lot of people when they think about the movement of the 60s they think about hippies and they think about drugs and, and rock and roll and that kind of stuff but a very powerful part of that movement 
was um, kind of seeing um, love as the primary motivation in, in life. And that, I was in Sweden at six, when I was 16 and I ran into people who were very idealistic and um, um, I, I think I just got um, the fire of doing, of, of, of service to others as being a pathway of love in the world. And it really has been carrying me since. I remember I did, um, um, when I came home from my first year in college, I, um, I gave probably my only sermon ever, <laughs> which is what the, the, the uh, Methodist Youth Fellowship president gets to do when they come back from college after Thanksgiving. And it was on 1 Corinthians 13, The Nature of Love. Mm. And it's funny because I'm just finishing up this new book, which is going to be parts work, a path of the heart. And it's basically that's that, that whole understanding of the nature of love is what I've been studying and trying to understand and trying to open to and open as a healing source in my work. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to feel that stream go all the way through 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who doesn't know that passage, first Corinthian, would you, What's the gist of it? Um, well, it's, uh, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love endures all, tolerates all. Um, it's this quality of love that um, uh, it, it can sound, it, and it can sound like too much. It's often used in sort of um, wedding vows or something, um, but with patient and kindness. But really this patience and kindness all comes from the same place that IFS, the internal family systems, self comes from, which I think is the nature of heart. Right. Mm -hmm. If we're centered in the core nature of our being, the qualities of patience and kindness and the ability to endure all and tolerate all is also a strength underneath it. It's not just being nice. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a state of mind that is able to embrace that which is there and uh, suffering as well as joy. Mm -hmm. So um, it's that state of mind that allows us to be in that kind of presence, which is what I've been working at cultivating in myself and in those mm -hmm. I work with um, on really all of this time. That's mm -hmm. the thing I think has been my goal. And you've, you're so well known into the internal family system world. Um, you uh, taught courses around that. You also have a book, Parts Work. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit your, how you found out about internal family system and how did you, your journey through spirituality? I know I heard you talk about it a little bit. Before. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, it's, it, there's two things. First, I was, I was finishing up my doctoral studies and I started having a bunch of clients, a number of clients who were having re religious struggles, spiritual struggles. And I had no idea how to integrate those into um, my mental health work with them. Somehow it was just a void and it hadn't been talked about in any of the, my graduate mm -hmm. studies. And there was this, um, a flyer arrived on the, the wall of this little um, clinic. It said, spirituality and counseling led by Pierre Velayat and Ayat Khan, Sufi master. And I thought, Pierre Velayat and Ayat Khan, Sufi master, what's that? But um, I said, spirituality and counseling, that's exactly what I'm interested in. So I went there and found this teacher of a universal spirituality, not, not um, it's, it's, um, it's a, Sufism is, is the mystical wing of Islam, but it has one wing of that is that is very universalist. And that was the wing that this was. And it was called the path of the heart. And there I found an inspiration for a spiritual framework that really has carried with me to this day. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went back home, I had this sense of the value of helping people to reconnect to their spiritual life. And one of the people I was working with had severe depression for years, no medication, no therapy was helping. She had um, psoriasis, skin disease, um, and I hadn't known what to do with her. And, um, but she had mentioned, uh, she was one of the people I was thinking about with the spiritual struggle. Mm -hmm. She was sexually abused by her priest. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was such a terrible thing because it cut her off from the very source of healing that she needed. Yeah. Right? yeah. So she was still a believer, but at the same time, she was all confused about her beliefs. Mm -hmm. And we, we found um, together a, a Saint Dymphna, which is both the saint of mental health, but also the, 
the, the saint of, of sexual uh, abuse um, survivors. And um, she began, we began in the therapy for her to just crystallize the questions and she prayed to Saint Nymphna. And I swear in three weeks, her depression was gone. Her psoriasis was gone. And I was thinking, I've been doing therapy for six years. I've never seen anything like that. Mm. What is this? You know, so it was like, it was, that's kind of one of the ways I start this new book is with that narrative, because it, it just set me on a path of saying there's huge healing power when a person can reconnect to their, to their spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then I tried for the next 10 years really to study that integration, but it was all intellectual. I was reading the books on it, but it was in the head. Okay. And it wasn't until I started working with IFS Internal that, family systems. In, internal family systems that I found a model where it integrated naturally. And I came to internal family systems because my wife, Lori, who's uh, helped author my our book, Parts Word, she um, was at a conference where she saw Dick Schwartz and he was introducing this model at that time in the late 80s. And she came home and she was really excited about it. And at that point I had had my three master's degrees. I had studied all kinds of therapies. I was actually burned out. I was ready to say, <laughs> done with this. I think I'll just teach developmental psychology at the university. <laughs> I do that pretty well. And this therapy thing is just not rewarding enough for me. Um, and I had been doing every therapy, every model of therapy I learned, I did my own therapy, right? And, and one of the main themes of the therapy in my last one was a two-year Jungian analysis where the main theme was, I want to stop being a therapist. <laughs> 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 and so, and, and I was really ready to quit. And then I said, I said, no, I don't want one more model. I have enough models. I'm just done. She said, no, no, you have to go see this. And so it sounded pretty strange, these different parts of ourselves and, uh, and right, a part of me says this, a part, and a part of me says, of me says that, yeah. and, and what is this multiplicity of our inner life thing? And, but as I listened to him, it started making sense. And mm -hmm. I live a couple of hours from Chicago. So I was able to go to Chicago and train with him back then. It was a very small group of five or six people that were, he was training. And uh, uh, I did my own therapy in that model with a person who had only been trained for a year. And in three or four sessions, I had undone some of the knots that mm -hmm. were creating my own burnout. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And so I started running around to all kinds of agencies telling every show, say, let me show you this new model. Let me show you this new model. <laughs> <laughs> I was like an evangelist. And yes. So, yeah. So, so, and then, you know, for people who are new to it, I, I really suggest, um, our, our book parts work because it's um, uh, written in everyday language. And mm -hmm. what I really like about it is it can be very relevant to people who have doctorates and people who are um, a completely non-psychologist, 12 year old kids love it. The, some of the parents report that their teenage kids take it up to the bedroom and they don't get it back for a while. Yes, 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 yeah. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a both everyday language and it's deep at the same time. Even though yes, it is. This is the book that Tom is talking about, Parts Work, and it's really fun. I recommend it often, lots of illustration, and it's so clear and such an easy flow. So thank you for this book, Tom. Yeah, and, and I'm so grateful for the artist, uh, Sharon Exton, who um, illustrated it. It has over 100 drawings in it. And when I'm teaching this particular work, the pictures are so important because it, it keeps us out of that sort of linear thinking of our left brain yeah. and to understand ourselves and others from a whole other way. So the pictures are really important. Absolutely. So that was, yeah, I just got really excited about it. And I was having a hard time teaching it actually as a kind of conceptual thing to large groups. And that's when I started thinking about using pictures and Sharon was one of my students and I had everybody do uh, illustrations of their own inner parts, the different, all the different parts of themselves. And Sharon does this illustration of her different parts and it was like, wow. So it turns out she was a professional artist getting re-educated in, in counseling psych. And, um, and I started using those pictures to teach people and all of a sudden where I had struggled in an hour to clarify what this model was about in five minute, 10 minute PowerPoint with pictures, 
people says, oh, yeah, I got that. Of course, that's you cool. got it. That's right. And, you know, I got inspired by you, Tom. And I actually taught at Hellenic College, Holy Cross. I taught a course on self-care for helping professionals. Yeah. So I've used part of the book, The Internal Family Systems, and we use the cards that are illustrated by Sharon in this book and also creating the map and the drawing. And it's, it's been quite an amazing journey. Yeah. I find that this, the model of parts work, especially combined with spirituality is the best um, self care. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it somehow flows together very well. Um, and uh it helps us to understand this. That's what it did for me. I mean, I found, first of all, I found for, I had this exhausted helper who was just, you know, like couldn't go on and wanted to stop, wanted to stop. And then I had this marathon running part of me says, we can do this. We can do this. I was, I'm a long distance runner. Right. So I <laughs> to fight through pain. And this guy was saying, we're just, so this guy could help till he dropped. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that part was there. And it, and it turns out when we got to know what was driving them, it was a little boy part who had picked up some burdens in the early part of my life. When I, um, um, I lost my sister um, mm -hmm. to a blood disease and this little boy picked up certain um, helping patterns that were burdensome. Mm -hmm. And um, I, through that work, I was able to, to release those from him so that he could still care for people and offer help but not with the same intense burden that he had yeah, always been That's wonderful. And what are you doing now, Tom? How do you help others currently? I know that you have several projects uh, internationally and also some books and yeah. yeah. So um, I, I've, I've kind of, you know, as you, as one gets older and, and instead of starting having to me more than a little bit, um, you kind of focus down. And what I'm doing now is two things. I, I'll do introductions to parts work in a mm -hmm. kind of general large group way. But most of my work is helping people who are already helping professionals mm -hmm. in two ways. One is if they're therapists to integrate parts work and spirituality. And if they're helping professionals in other ways, um, how I can um, help them with burnout prevention through the parts work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what motivated me to go to Jordan where when the Syrian refugees were flooding into Jordan. And what I did there was work with the mental health professionals at first, primarily um, with their own burnout prevention, mm -hmm. right? So working with them to keep them from burning out, but they were so interested in the model that then I, I continued on also doing some trainings in the parts work model. Um, so I would, I, I, in Germany, I still do both of those things. And, and I've gone to Korea. The, the wonderful thing about parts work is it seems to fit all cultures. It adapts mm -hmm. to different cultures, mm -hmm. right? So um, uh, it works in the Middle East, it works in the Far East. It's, um, uh, I, I, actually my first training happened in internationally in 19, um, early 1990s, 93, we went to uh, Lithuania and Russia right after the fall of the Soviet Union. Mm, wow. And, uh, uh, Lori offered family therapy training and I offered um, parts work workshops. Mm -hmm. So, and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> yes. And your book has been translated now in what yeah, language? Yeah, it's in, it's in, um, so uh, it's authored in English and it's been in German, Italian, um, uh, Arabic. We have uh, at least part of it done in Arabic, and we've just um, and Korean has been out for a long time, and the Chinese uh, just uh, um, a publisher um, is going to publish it in a year or so, and a French edition will be coming out, and the Greek edition will be coming. Wow! Out. Congratulations! Yes, and you have a book coming up soon. Yeah. Um, so what I what, what this book. The, the parts workbook is really a kind of general introduction of how mm -hmm. to use this model to understand yourself and, and some about how it takes part in the healing process. This, this next book is called Parts Work, A Path of the Heart, Integrating IFS and Spirituality. And that book is, is basically in this book, I share um, how I integrate spirituality into the work itself in a, in a mm -hmm. kind of stepwise manner. And then I just give cases um, okay. where um, I give transcripts from sessions and how the, the work unfolded and what it really looks like when that happens for individuals. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that's, so basically it's healing stories then, 
that at the same time shows you how how that happens. And if you're a therapist, you can mm -hmm. kind of get a sense for, oh, that's how I could do that if, the, if I was already a parts work therapist. Right. But I, I'm thinking that it's interesting for um, anybody interested in how spirit spirituality can come into the, mm -hmm. the um, healing process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. And part of your work is also going to Germany, right? You go twice a year to help them. Right. And I, I just came back and, and it was very interesting because um, one of the uh, the main themes this time was because Germany is so close to Ukraine and they've been without war for 70 years in the European area. Suddenly all of the memories of war and a great deal of the people have um, histories of being refugees because when the Russians came in from the East, um, millions of Germans had to flee to the West. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of trauma that happened to people mm -hmm. in that process. Um, and so all of this kind of family history of trauma was activated and, and the people who were working with clients were reporting this, they weren't sleeping, they were waking up with nightmares, there was all kinds of things. So I made that the theme of the work this time. And it was interesting because one of the chapters in my book is about a particular woman's um, healing from uh, childhood um, sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and she just happened to come to this workshop. I hadn't seen her for a number of years. She happened, she's a therapist and she happened to come to this workshop. And um, it turns out through this topic, she became aware that her mother was severely traumatized. She knew that intellectually, but her right. mother was severely traumatized by the war and that she had been carrying this war trauma in her, a six-year-old child part of herself that had been repressed and was now mm -hmm. coming up through the exercises I was doing that was helping people to focus on the parts that were activated in this war situation. And she does a really, she does a really beautiful healing of this part. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just today have been communicating with her and finishing up. I said, is this accurate? Is this what I, is this what you experienced? And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a really lovely thing. Cause it's one of the things about this book is that I'm collaborating with people to tell their story. Right, right. Not my perception of it. It's my perception and their perception and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the experience. And when I have transcripts, it's really great because then this is what was said. But um, it's also what happened inside them that mm -hmm. they were able to tell. Right, right. Oh, this so, 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 sounds so meaningful. For me, one of the, you know, like, um, I've been, you know, I'm, when I work with people, I'm open to whatever spiritual tradition they bring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for me when a spiritual tradition is offering that which i hope one would offer it helps us to deal with suffering um mm -hmm. as well as finding sources of joy it needs to have both things mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and sometimes that can be a real challenge so um one of the stories is in the book is about um uh, <clears throat> a work with a psychiatrist from lebanon who was a boy uh, eight years old uh, during the Lebanese Civil War, mm -hmm. and he's a um, Maronite Christian. And um, at one point when he was coming home from school, there was a car bomb um, and, and it killed a whole lot of kids that were all around him. And um, uh, at that point, this was a part that he had kind of repressed. But um, when the blast went off in the Beirut Harbor last year, right, he started having memories of that explosion as a child. And he remembered, he found this, this eight-year-old part of him was on the roof shouting at Jesus, so angry at Jesus for letting this happen. Mm -hmm. How could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? And it's those moments in the spiritual journey where something so awful happens, it shakes your faith. And... Um, <clears throat> through the parts work, we were able to allow him to be present with that boy and present with um, his despair and anger and hopelessness. And because the way this parts work works, we are able to separate out from the parts that are reacting really strongly and be present with them from this loving, compassionate, calm place. So he was able to get into that spot, be with the boy, accept his anger. Right, right. 
which is a scary thing because if you're eight years old and you have belief, you don't want to be angry at God. I mean, that could right. be dangerous, right? Yes. Angry at God, you could you could end up in or eight year olds and older. <laughs> <laughs> and older, anybody, anytime. In fact, right. that's a scary, all through life when that happens. How do we be angry with God? Yes. You know? And um, what happened in the process was um, I, I tear up when I think about it because it's, it was so moving. Um, I, um, I asked him, is Jesus there? So first he was with the boy. The boy was on the roof. The boy was angry. He was able to accept. And the boy felt validated. Okay, it's okay if I have this anger. So he was able to know that and he wasn't going to be condemned. Mm -hmm. And I said, is Jesus there? And he said, yes, Jesus is there. Um, and he said, and he's crying. <laughs> and it was like, mm. to me, it was such an illustration of um, how, of really what, what Jesus represents, right? Of, of feeling the suffering of the world. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I am with you in this suffering. Right? And I feel the pain that this was and it's painful for me as well you know he didn't articulate he just mainly noticed right. the tears and the crying um and so then all of a sudden it was like he didn't have to be disconnected right separated yeah separated he could still be in contact at the same time there was a deep hopelessness that came right because um Okay, if Jesus can't do anything about this. Right, then who can? <laughs> who can? This this world is a pretty awful place and we're stuck mm -hmm. in it. Right. And so the nice thing about parts work then is we could find the hopelessness and let him focus on it in the body and notice this hopelessness. And he saw it as this stone in his belly. Right. And in even though it was very dark and heavy, there was a, a slight glow in it. Mm. And he said, okay, there's something that needs to happen with this hopelessness. And sometimes in IFS, what you would do is you would work with him releasing the hopelessness or healing mm -hmm. the hopelessness. Mm -hmm. But he felt, no, I need to just leave it there for now and that something else will happen. And so we left it at that point. I'm doing this on Zoom with him, you know, yes. limited time. So, um, uh, so it turns out that a few days later, he was at communion. Mm. And in the communion, all of a sudden, this, this dark heaviness, hopelessness began to, to glow and to rise up. And, and he had like an epiphany of, of, of experience of connection to um, a divine hope. Wow. That Very powerful. Of, yeah. And moving. And what was really important about that was he had actually raised this issue with me. He came to me with to talk about this because after the blast in Beirut, his friends had said, you know, come and help me um, help us clean up after that. And he says, I can't, I can't go there. And he know he normally, he would be helping. He would be doing that. Right, right, right. I can't do it. I What's can't do it. Triggering. He was frozen. Mm -hmm. And after doing this work and after the experience of communion, he was able to go to the families who had lost um, their, their sons and brothers and the explosion as firefighters and deal with their loss and anger from mm -hmm. this place of deep peace and calm. And, and it compassion and love. Compassion and love. Wow. Right? So, um, uh, yeah. So the, and that, that kind of represents to me what the, what this is all about. How do we work, yeah. touch the suffering, um, and and notice that there's a place of transformation of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, yeah. So that's the kind of thing that I want to share in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think mm -hmm. it's really important for people to hear. <clears throat> that this can happen, that this there's a there's a way for this type mm -hmm. of healing. to unfold, yeah, and to bring that hope. Yeah. That's right. And that even in the darkest places mm -hmm. that, can, that can awaken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's part of and you know, all of my work isn't just um 
heavy, dark, dealing with, you know, trauma. I, when I do my groups, I do peace dances. I do these <laughs> circle dances, dances of universal peace. You know that we're doing Shabbat Shalom and Assalamu Alaikum singing together in circles. And that to me is, it's very important to be able to touch joy. As mm-hmm. well. mm-hmm. If we're going to touch suffering, we have to be able to touch joy. Mm-hmm. Or the sources of joy. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. And you mentioned earlier, also in your journey, how you were burned out and then you had those paths of transformation. So how does that, how does the regeneration look like for you now on a daily basis, right? There's a sense of you've done some inner work that brought in some awareness around burnout. And there was, you mentioned some, some parts, some reaction aspects of yourself, right? They were burdened and conditioned in a certain way and the striver and the helper and whatnot. And once you've got that insight, how did you integrate it and what's your regeneration right now? You know, one of the things that I'm aware of is, um, you know, spiritual traditions have built some structures in that really make a lot of sense. And uh, one of those structures is daily practice. Mm-hmm. Or even in like Islam, where you have the, the the five prayers a day, right? So that you stop and right. do that. Or but the but Christian the hours, absolutely the hours, the, exactly. And you have, so there are these these daily practices that can bring you back in connection. So I try to have that be part of my daily life. I have a, a meditation room uh, that's also my consultation room, right? So it's it's like both things are together. And um, I have symbols of, of, of um, spiritual symbols that help awaken to me. One of mine is the winged heart is, is a very important thing. And I have here um, in, in my room in the window, this winged heart was given to me by um, my staff. And the whole, I taught in the holistic health program, was the director of it for a number of years. And at the end of it, they created that glass. Everybody put a little piece of the glass. Oh, that's so beautiful. So, um, yeah, so the, so um, I have symbols that remind me, I actually have a, another one daily repractice in my consultation room. So above the, the, um, the, where the clients might sit kind of across from my chair is a picture yes. of my overburdened little boy. Yes, yes. Right? I, oh, that's in the card, in the pack of... Uh, in the pack, pack of cards. Of cards. Yeah. And, and Sharon made that for me. And I just... <laughs> Who doesn't know this? There's also a pack um, coming with this book of like 50 or 60 cards representing different aspects of ourselves. So that's one of them. Yes. Yeah. So that little boy part of me was the one who had picked up the burden when my sister died Mm -hmm. and had this habit. And he still has a habit sometimes of picking up over responsible things. Right. So that I have that picture there to remind me to say, Hey, Tommy, (laughs) Tommy. Um, Hey, Tommy, remember, we don't have to do that. And he goes, Oh yeah, I forgot. And now my, my main image of Tommy is he's sitting on the world sort of a little pic instead of being carrying the world he's sitting on it kind of calmly looking thoughtfully there and saying tom here's can you can you do something here you know and i say well maybe i say but we really can't that's you know that what we can do is this right right right. so you'd have those inner conversations and i love it that you have the reminders as well remind that part we don't have to do and he's pretty well you know he knows he knows that oh yeah okay so I'm just, I just want to check. <laughs> and um, so I make sure that I, I daily notice in myself when I'm picking up things that I don't really need to be carrying. That's so beautiful. And I think that's such a resonance with myself and what I'm inviting people into is this idea of the daily regeneration. I mean, they've been either researching a burnout cycle as well, that we've got to go through a cycle of, of regeneration on a daily basis, uh, along with uh, faith traditions. And um, what I'm hearing from you is like, I do, you do those, med- your, your so practices I have, uh, daily. I, I, do a, I, do a, I do a Qigong first, just sort of an energy okay. collection and purification practice. So just kind of imagining myself kind of releasing those things that are ready to be released and bringing in like a, a healing energy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I, I sit and, um, 
do various meditations depending on what's working for me at this time, right? Mm -hmm. And that changes over time. Mm -hmm. So um, it's usually, it's connected to some of my basic uh, spiritual practices mm -hmm. that I've been using for a long time. But also over the years, I change it in different ways depending on what works for me best. I How remember do you when know I, when something is working for well, you? So you'll know to update it. Well, you know, I mean, one of the things I, I taught in holistic health for a long time, and we have people experiment with different kinds of meditations. And, you know, a lot of people think they sit down and, okay, now I have this mantra or have this thing I'm saying to myself or phrase or prayer. But mostly I'm just sitting here thinking. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and, you know, you can say, okay, get those thoughts, let them go. Beware of the thoughts, let them go. So, what, what I do is I help people to find, um, find what's working for you now to help you recenter in yourself. For some people, that's taking a walk. For mm -hmm. some people, it's sitting on the porch in the morning with a cup of coffee, looking at nature, feeling the birds sing. Absolutely. That centers them. And then they, they, they feel calmer and in themselves. So I really invite people to find what brings you back to that calm center. The calm center. And that's how you, you judge for yourself, right? What practices are working in terms of right. that sense of calm and grounded presence. When I was very busy at the university and my manager parts, one of the types of parts we have are the ones that are always making lists and planning or worrying about this or getting ready for that. And those are some active parts I have in my brain. And when I was at the university, particularly, I couldn't just sit. I would just, I'd just be planning the whole time, planning my class, doing this, doing that. You know, it was like, all right, so I, I sat for 15 minutes, but really, you know, <laughs> not helping very much. Uh, <clears throat> so what I did then is I began to learn, um, memorize poems and prayers. Mm -hmm. And that was such a wonderful thing because um, you can take some phrase that um, uh, maybe is very Im important to you and just go through the process of memorizing it and repeating it. So the words are there. Actually, it gives the manager something to do mm -hmm. to help me. Mm -hmm. So Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace was one that I used for a long time. You know, um, uh, the, the, the one that's my core practice. And the beautiful thing is that after you've done this, you have these prayers that can come to you or these poems that can come to you. Spontaneously. Um, yeah, Spontaneously. that's right. And so, um, uh, and they also, I think, for me, there's certain things that crystallize the whole meaning of this, of my journey here on this earth. Mm. So, and when do I know when I'm in tune? And when do I know when I'm out of tune? So <clears throat> one of the um, the teachers from this um, spiritual tradition, this universal Sufi tradition um, is called Moinadin Chisti. And 800 years ago, he gave this teaching in his last uh, sermon before he died. And one of the core phrases of it is, um, <clears throat> be overflowing with peace and joy and scatter this wherever you are and wherever you go. Be a blazing fire of truth, be a beautiful blossom of love, and be a soothing balm of peace. Mm. And with this spiritual light, dispel the darkness of ignorance, dissolve the clouds of discord and war, and send goodwill, peace, and understanding among the people. Mm, so beautiful. So it seemed to carry everything in these few mm -hmm. words and have such heart in it. And so at that, as was one of my meditations for a while, was just to repeat this and to repeat it. And now I, I don't use it so much as my meditation as I use it as my attunement. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like you have a tuning fork and you want to, you want to hit a C, you go bing, ah. <clears throat> so this is like, okay, Am I doing that which will help me be in resonance with this way of being in the world? Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're often not, right? Mm -hmm. we're grumpy or irritated or, or, or despairing about this or that. And right. And this is where I'm hearing you that different uh, practices can help or inner conversations like with a burden, young Tom, or right. other parts internally, right? Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, exactly. And so, so we, you, you, and, and often, it, well, one of, I like one of the things Jack Cornfield said about meditation and it comes together. And I, he said, notice who your frequent visitors are. <laughs> so yeah. who are your, your frequent visitors when you sit down and try to be quiet? Mm -hmm. And those are your main parts, yeah. right? So it's also useful to kind of write down what are the, the different thoughts that you have and what parts do those belong to? Mm -hmm. So I can say, okay, manager, um, we're, we're, we're working on just meditating for the next five minutes or so. Do you want to meditate with me or do you want to go somewhere else and plan? So, yeah. <laughs> so he can either sit down and meditate with me or he can go somewhere else inside. Mm -hmm. and, and what you just shared is so beautiful because the whole premise of internal family system and what it brings to the world is this idea of having very loving, compassionate conversation inside as opposed to many spiritual traditions for, for years have done, if you use repression and kind of an inner violence of, you know, closing clack of, of different thoughts or, or negative emotions, which in time violence breeds more violence as opposed to the sense of inner compassion, inner love, including with our parts or manager, what firefighters, whatever it's inside that has an agenda and it's, you know, on a mission um, right. And one of the great basic principles of, of internal family systems, IFS, is that all of the parts have a positive intention right. for our system. They're right. all there for a reason. Absolutely, absolutely. And many of the some many of the mystical traditions, including Christianity, that's the premise that everything that is created, it's in God's image and it's good. There's not an inherent badness to it. Uh, which I found so refreshing and sometimes gets lost in translations, you know, over, over exactly. centuries. Exactly. And, and, but I mean, the different parts of our self can get out of balance. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and burden condition. And, and, yeah. and, and causing us or others harm. Mm -hmm. So understanding what's behind their, their maybe extreme behavior or mm -hmm. their harmful behavior is the step to turn towards it with compassionate curiosity mm -hmm. and um and i really i really like that about the parts work model mm -hmm. that it, it, it's a very clear kind of structure of coming into relationship to these different aspects of who we are right and there's a sense of your you're connecting and teaching others and also for yourself connecting with different parts that might live in the mind with different emotional parts right from the past either burden or or traumatized in different situations and how about on a, i mean you mentioned on a physical level um is there particular things that you do well, or other I mean, I practices you do. I, I run. I still okay. run. You, you know? still run. I'm over seventy now, but I still run. And uh, that's so cool. Um, uh, and because I, you know, I noticed in my freshman year at college, I'd always played sports in high school, but by the time I got to college, I was a little too small to play American football. Right? <laughs> so, um, uh, and I noticed that I, because I wasn't getting exercise, I. I you know, I was really prone to depression and, and mm -hmm. kind of disorientation. And in addition to a little bit of helpful counseling, I went out for soccer and had something else that I could do to, um, to run. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it physiologically, it's, it's key to me um, mm -hmm. to, to stay centered. I have to do something physical. I also, the other thing is um, I'm basically more introverted. I need time to by myself to recover mm -hmm. but i have a lot of things that are calling me in to action in everyday life so sometimes i neglect that and one neglect of the, the inner inner silence the, and inner. giving myself enough time alone yes. mm -hmm. and um there's a chapter in the book where laurie and i to look at a little dynamic because she's extroverted and i'm introverted it's one oh of in this book yes i remember this the z pattern that's right. So, That's so, cool. so we, one of the things we have to work out is her need for social stimulation and activity and my need yes. for yes. quiet and alone time and trying to find those in balance. And uh, one of the awarenesses that came out of when we, were, we kind of developed that Z out of our own work with each other, she's very good at noticing when I have this grumpy part that <laughs> starts to come out when I haven't been taking, giving myself that quiet time. 
And so every once in a while, she'll say, Tom, you haven't had a retreat for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Very gently. Kind of yeah, so, so now I know that Grumpy's been in, in uh, around <laughs> lately. Yeah. And uh, I, I just need to, in addition to the daily practice, I have to have, you know, two or three days where I just go to a cabin and am mm-hmm. alone and can oh, walk in nature. Yeah. And, That's know. great awareness. And I'm glad that you brought this in. If you are in partnership, you're in a couple. In this book, there is a section talking about how different parts interact with one another and how things can get stuck. There's many times misunderstanding. And just by knowing this, I know using even the cards I use with my husband, Sebastian, I use, we use your cards, you know, which parts in me are activated, which parts in my husband is activated. And it just shifts the conversation. Oh, it's just a part of you. It's not all of you. And there's all of a sudden more spaciousness, more compassion. So be sure to check out this book and, and look at that Z pad well, where we and, get stuck as couple. Yeah, it's it's really I think it's and I found all over the world when we share that that's useful for people. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and uh, Lori and I go uh, ahead. I was just going to say, Lori and I um, have made some videos of our using the cards, not in the Z pattern, okay. but just how we use them together. It was, um, and uh, that's on my website. So you can look at those videos about how to use the cards. And it shows very to, good. We do our own work uh, in the videos. With so, that, yes. And we are going to post under the video. You're going to see Tom's uh, website and you can check all those videos out. Oh, this is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's part of self care as well and renewal, right? If, if you're in a family, and this is not just with a couple, I've done it with our kids. I've done it. They've done it with their friends. I mean, it's just yeah. such a helpful way and it restores the equilibrium and the balance and a sense of larger container that can only help with renewal and regeneration. Right. So she understands where, what grumpy grumpy's job is to, yes. to, to sort of let me know that something's wrong. Right. But sometimes he's not very good at articulating. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So I need to, I need to just know that. And she knows, she knows that he tends to get there. I get tend to get grumpy when I haven't been taking care of myself. And um, what a lovely invitation. Hey, it's time for a retreat. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, Mm -hmm. so she's very supportive of that and that it makes a big difference. And I understand her needs for social interaction and to be around people and, And um, so we arrange our life so that we can have a balance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She doesn't have to do everything with me. She can do things on her own at times uh, with her friends and that works out. And then I'm, I can have some alone time. And so it's, it's important to, to know that um, it's not because you're not enough that, that she needs something else. Right. Right. There's different needs, different rhythms, and you're such a loving couple and respectful of each other. There is a sense of, you, I can take care of my own needs, and that's not selfish. Right. That actually helps us be more self-regulated and better partners, better human beings. And, and ideally, I, need, I can know my own needs and let her know yeah. that. She, it's right. not her responsibility to notice that I need it. Right, right. It would be better if I can do that myself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, but, but that always doesn't, I don't always notice in time. Right, right. And, uh, yeah. So she can help me notice. This is so wonderful. Thank you for sharing all this. This is so rich. And I wonder as we're going to wrap up, is there any other tips or suggestions you have for givers that might be watching this that have a heart to impact the world, no matter what the profession is, Mm -hmm. they do want to make an impact and to maintain this regeneration and a sense of grounded presence. One of the first, there may be some others, but one of the things that I think about is noticing when I'm doing something and it leaves me more filled with energy afterwards versus depleted. So there might be a certain type of helping activity that just really fills me up. And so when I do my workshops uh, on healing the healer, I feel filled afterwards. I feel more of who I am. I feel more alive. Um, but there are other times when I'm doing a certain type of work it was at the university, I felt depleted and drained. I just like mm-hmm. a short circuit. And, and, gotcha. and then there's so noticing and then there's, but there's also like, oh, I can't see so many clients of this type or 
I can't do this type of work. It's too draining for me mm. to notice that. But here I'm able to do it and get recharged. Mm-hmm. And maybe I can do more of this, that, this helping that recharges me and less of the one that leaves me depleted. And mm-hmm. you have to work with the parts of you that say, well, yeah, but this is really important work here. This should be done. <laughs> <clears throat> and sort of like, yeah, and I'm limited, you know, yes, so it's yes. like knowing mm-hmm. um, those limits. Um, right. those, yeah. So knowing the limits, and I'm also hearing as a sense of inner awareness of our energy level, right? Exactly. To pay attention to what happens in the interaction Can we help and in the same time be replenished? And that is not selfish. That might be a sign of more of an inclination of what's what's a good way of giving. Is that what I would that be fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. What replenishes us and what depletes us. And um, one of the things that Thich Nhat Hanh was talking, he's a Vietnamese Buddhist teacher that I studied with for 10 years. And um, one of his teachings was. He said, um, there's a concept in, in the Buddhist teaching of the Brahma Vihara, and one of the qualities is sympathetic joy. In other words, noticing that someone else's joy is your joy. Mm-hmm. And he said, because of that, you need to be around people who know joy. Mm-hmm. And you need to understand what brings joy to you, not just short-term happiness, but what brings joy. Um, and he said, if you go to a therapist, make sure that therapist knows joy. Mm. You don't want to get stuck in the therapist that's stuck in just the suffering, right? Mm-hmm. There needs to be a basis of joy there mm. as well. And I thought, wow, we don't have a course in joy at the university. <laughs> right, right. So that's a very good suggestion, kind of monitor for joy. And I wonder, as we wrap up, I mean, sometimes many people live in their head sometimes it's hard to even notice the body right we get so busy with life and whatnot I've been there decades ago what kind of um, noticing can help in terms of that kind of inner energy I know you know you know the polyvagal theory right now they talk about the smart vagus the sense of peace versus when we're in fight or flight versus and this is kind of a one of the medical uh, scientific knowledge for a long time ago, but is there a way, how do you, um, so uh, tips around uh, that? Yeah. I, well, um, you know, just awareness of breath. Um, if, if you are in a situation where you sometimes feel this wonderful presence or joy, if that's in a spiritual gathering or in nature, if you anchor that in your breath, you know, um, like just aware breathing and breathing in whatever that quality is and breathing it out and letting it spread into your body. I really, when, when I'm doing my workshops, we have these very open, spacious, joyful um, atmospheres that get created. And I really encourage people to breathe that in so that it's with them when they go home, right? So there's a sense of feeling in the heart, right? There's an energetic presence. Uh, feeling joy. One of the things I always do is I do a lot of singing and movement <clears throat> in my workshops. And some of the polyvagal people, and you may you know more about this than I do, but they were <laughs> saying, oh, now I know why that works. Why Now I know why so much healing can happen in your weekends, Tom. You have us all singing and attuning to each other. And we're all, you know, um, coming into attunement uh, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, with our body. And um, through this polyvagal way of understanding it, you know, mm-hmm. and for me it was just like, whoa, it feels really, you know, I feel really good when I when I when I sing and when I um, move and sing together with people, you know. Like right. Just- so for people watching this, it could be a sense of ease, a sense of joy, as you said, a sense of uh, maybe lightness, a sense of peace you know look for things like that some uh, an ease in the body or yeah, and I, clarity i like to have for, for me i uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and actually the number of traditions teach walking meditations mm-hmm. like you can take a particular phrase that carries a particular quality with you and notice like with your steps like um, a particular quality on one step would be um like for me a long time 
uh, you know, love, love, love on the inhalation, you know, peace, peace, peace on the exhalation. And just feeling that with each of my steps. And I, I just practiced that over and over. Mm -hmm. And then I found that even when I was at the university walking to a difficult meeting where I know I was going to have a hard time staying centered, I would naturally be saying those phrases to myself. So mm -hmm. finding the words and just anchoring them in something that happens every day. Every day, you have to walk from your car to somewhere or you right. walk outside to somewhere. Right. You know? So yep. in that moments when you're walking somewhere, returning with your breath and your awareness to any quality that you want more of. That's right. So the sense of paying attention to the activities, the feedback we get in our body or feelings or in our mind, kind of anchor it, have a remembrance of it, and then practice it on a daily basis. Could be like walking or something that you, you might do on a daily basis to right. continue to grow that inside yeah. practice or a chanting practice yeah yeah, yeah. That's wonderful yeah wow this is this has been so rich and so so much wisdom and and joy and um thank you for sharing all this this is well thank you for giving a, an opportunity for me to just kind of explore and and share these things which are really so um, dear to me and um, mm -hmm. that I feel very blessed to have um, still be part of this world and being able mm -hmm. to share um, with others and connect with others in this kind of heartfelt mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. right. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for being yeah. here. Yeah, my pleasure, and uh, good luck with your work. And I'm I'm excited that you're you know finding these ways to offer your your wisdom and understanding to the world through um, through your new, new venture here. Thank you. Thank you again, Tom, for being here today. What a wonderful journey. And thank you for sharing and really bringing from your heart, from your true self, so much wisdom, so much experience. And we wish you good luck with your new book that's publishing this summer. And I'm very grateful for your presence and wish you all the blessings from in all the work that you're doing. And I thank you for all of you for being present today and watching this renewal conversation until next time i say goodbye for now <laughs>